Yo, yo, this is your girl, Jula. You're listening to the Pastry Bear Podcast with Winston Murdoch. Hola, hola, esta es Jula. Estás escuchando el Pastry Bear Podcast con Winston Murdoch. The continuation of life depends on viable healthy seeds, which are not only allocated for the regeneration of new plants, but also serves to provide the greatest concentration of nutrients for us humans. Today's episode is one part of a multiple series on seeds that are responsible for the creation of the Jamaican cuisine we know. What up y'all? And welcome to another episode of the Pastry Bear Podcast. I'm your host, Winston Murdoch. Una Sikiliza Pastry Bear Podcast. Seeds play a vital role in the human diet as food. The creation of the Caribbean civilization and food culture is built on seeds. Generation of farmers kept adequate supplies to ensure the continuation of their specific crop secret to their tribe. Traveling far and wide, planting them wherever they reside. Most seeds are edible, both in their raw stage, such as passion fruit, pomegranate, pumpkin, ganja or marijuana, dragon fruit, even guava seeds. Tomato seeds, sweet cup seeds, which is a family of the passion fruit, even eggplant seeds. But one of the most popular seeds that we consume, and one of the most expensive seed, is vanilla. We can consume these seeds in their raw stage, because they can pass through the digestive system easily. Most of the other seeds consumed by humans only become attractive when they are cooked. Some of those seeds are gungo, red kidney peas, black eye pea, cow peas, corn, wheat, rice, just to name a few. Understanding the fundamental value that they play in society is essential. So let me take a moment to break down the genetical makeup of the seed. The first question we have to ask, what are seeds? Seeds are considered to be flowering plants, units of reproduction, capable of developing into another such plant. A seed is a plant embryo and food reserve enclosed in a protective outer coating called a seed coat. You know, more generally, the term seed means anything that can be sown, which may include seed, husk, and tubers. The first part of the seed that we will talk about is the testa. The testa primary function is to protect the endosperm and the embryo. Now bear with me here. I know you're wondering how does this information can be implemented in the daily lives of chefs in their cooking. If you understand the genetical makeup of your ingredients and this is something that I constantly say it will be much more straightforward to manipulate its composition, to create new, exciting flavors, textures, and tastes. So let's now dive deeper and look at the major components of a seed, the endosperm. The endosperm is like the supermarket for the seeds embryo, which we can consider as the baby. The endosperm supplies the necessary nutrients for growth and development of the seed's embryo. It is essential to highlight these two elements and understand how they work when preparing a dish. Let's look deeper guys. The carbohydrate that is present in seeds can act as a thickener. For example, have you ever made a soup with a seed like kidney peas or kidney bean like it's called in some parts of the world? And you realize that when that bean is overcooked, the outer skin, the testa, becomes tender, breaking away, exposing the embryo and the endosperm. 
It is in this state that the bean starts to absorb the liquid, creating a thickener, which eliminates the need for the roux or a flour slurry for its thickening capabilities. In return, this carbohydrate that is found in the endosperm and the embryo intensifies the flavor, texture, and taste of the soup. Another important fact is that the endosperm also provides a suitable source of plant-based protein. As little as one cup of cooked beans offer 15 grams of plant-based protein. Now, let's move on to the embryo. It is a section that contains all the elements of the new plant, from roots to stem and micro leaves just waiting to come in contact with soil and water to germinate or to be cooked and consumed by humans as a means of feeding the soul and nourishing the body. There are millions of seeds globally and for us to explore it, it will take weeks, possibly months. But today, we will discuss some of the essential seeds used in Jamaican cuisine providing a clear understanding of how you can use them to their fullest potential. potential. Whoa, we're cooking up a storm today. <laughs> Aku suka mendengarkan podcast Pastry Bear. Pastry Bear podcast bikin them real good. Pastry Bear. Jangan lupa like, comment, subscribe. Cereals are one of the main seeds used in Jamaica and worldwide. Now I know you may be saying to yourself, cereals are seeds? Yes, they are. The three critical cereals in human food history are wheat, rice, and corn. And yes, they are seeds. Because if you plant any one of these three things, you're going to get a reproduction of the same plant. A larger percentage of the main dish of Jamaica contains one, two, and sometimes even three of these ingredients. The introduction of these seeds became popular to the Caribbean during the migration of Africans, Indians, Europeans, Spanish, as they were cheaper and in some instance healthier renewable source of food to feed the growing working population. Now, we're seeing more consumption of these cereals rather than roots and tubers, which were more common amongst the indigenous people and Africans early on in the years. Can you imagine Caribbean cuisine without rice, corn, and wheat? And when I say wheat, I mean flour. These cereals and their byproducts have cultivated many dishes that we love. First, let's look at wheat one of the leading products that shaped the cuisine of Jamaica. Wheat seeds are processed into flour by removing the brand, revealing the endosperm and the embryo. It is then milled to a powder substance called flour. Flour is then combined with other ingredients to be used in the production of various dishes. The history of wheat flour was said to have been introduced to Jamaica around the 17th to 18th century. It was first occasionally given to the African workers on the plantation as a part of their rations. The flour wasn't widely used back then, as it needed too much equipment and processing to be consumed. Unlike ground provision like yam and planting, they could be just boiled and eaten. In these times, the indigenous people and the Africans' main cooking method were boiling and roasting, and most of their cooking was done outside on a wood fire, on a three-legged pot. With the limitation in technology and economical resource, a variety of pots and pans were not readily at their disposal to maximize the use of the wheat flour. This factor created a slow pace and in some cases no growth in the utilization of the seeds byproduct. 
This is the reason the boiled dumpling is one of the most popular dishes made with wheat flour in the homes of Jamaicans to this present day. Una Sikiliza Pastry Bear Podcast. Watch on a murder. Pastry Bear. Pastry Bear. Pastry Bear Podcast beating them real good. As years pass, the manufacturing industry and globalization helped to implement some level of progress in the food production industry. The introduction of leveling agents, raising agents, brick ovens, various fats, oils, sweeteners and flavoring agents has created a steady growth in the use of wheat flour, allowing the production of items such as Excelsior water crackers, cocoa bread, patty, rock cake, spice bun, puddings, ginger bulla, donut, cookies, and the infamous hard dough bread. The very dense, thick crust white loaf takes its name from the structure and composition of the bread. Its hardness has made its way into the diet of Jamaicans since as early as possibly 18th to 19th century. Its popularity has increased over the next hundred years. Taste, texture and size, cost and presentation has seen tremendous change. Unlike breads from Europe that explored producing a more aerated, soft, elastic internal structure and a crispy external crust, the hard old bread main texture is compact and collapsed and lose its shape when squeezed, making it solid. While we have seen a vast use of wheat flour in the manufacturing industry, the homes of the locals have yet to see much change. Studies have shown that bread from wheat flour and rice, which is the next seed we will discuss, is a staple that cannot be replaced. As a matter of fact, in 1988, it was reported that Jamaica could not wean from the product of wheat flour, no matter the price increase. And if you view the shopping carts or the menu on the local restaurant cook shops, soups isn't a soup without dumpling. Jerk chicken can't be served without a slice of bread. Fried fish is never served without festival. Even the coating of the chicken is the wheat flour. Fish to the history and progression of the food culture of many of the known products made by wheat flour can be tied to a few Jamaican commercial bakeries, which can be traced back to the early 17th century. At this time, the wheat flour used was of a lesser quality and produced a more inferior product that struggled to sell. This in turn caused many of the wheat products that was consumed on the island to be imported which resulted in a decline in many of the bakeries. The unfavorable conditions surrounding wheat created a challenge. You see, it was difficult for it to transport because it was coming from American and other international markets, and it was also a challenge to store. So then, there was the initiation of the incorporation of the Jamaica Flour Mill Limited in 1964 to improve the quality of the flour which would enhance the quality of the products, increasing productivity and profitability. The new mill was able to import the grain and milled it locally, which produced a higher quality, maximizing its use in various areas. For example, the brand that was removed from the grain was used into livestock feed. Before then, some of the critical flour that were imported were superfine flour or number two, shop flour, baking flour, work. then these products were then categorized into counter flour, shop grade flour, medium grade flour, and vary in price and quality. 
some of the major brands were Knickerbocker, Rip Van Winkle, and Washburn Crosby, gold medal. But since the inception of the Jamaica flour mill, there has been a fast rise in new companies and products. Some of the more notable companies and products are Caribbean made for Lascelles, Caribbean flour for Mossos, Caribbean flour, Baker's Choice for Grace, and Northern King for Gettys Grant. So it's clear to see how such a slight improvement like the implementation of the Jamaican flour mill and the organization of the Baker's Association changed the trajectory of the use of wheat flour. Jamaica's love for wheat flour products forced bakers to start making more products. In the 20th century, fresh local bagels, oat brand bread, Syrian bread, and pita could be found in supermarket shelves. There was also an increase in the demand for biscuits and cookies, which typically were imported. But one specific biscuit that stood out is a hard dry biscuit called water crackers. The Jamaican water crackers, which were originated in America, made its way in the diets of the locals through the foresight of the Jamaican Biscuit Company that started its operation in 1911. It was marketed to be a wheat flour product that can be eaten for dinner or lunch, but was mostly consumed for breakfast or coated with various condiments or dipped in hot chocolate or tea. In some instance, you see Jamaicans eating it in soup, with fish and vegetables, or even in hot cereals. Excelsior water crackers became the most recognized brand in the space. The Jamaican Biscuit Company continued to create wheat flour biscuits such as Five O'Clock, Honey Girl, Orange Crisp, Ginger Snap. Around the 1920s, they launched Victoria Biscuit, Malt Biscuit, and Contingent Biscuit. In 1938, there was a chocolate cream biscuit, picnic cream, and Mustafa cake, which is a shortbread cookie. Their victorious run got cut short when National Bakery entered the market. The market. The market. Pastry Bear. Pastry Bear podcast beating them real good. Watching the up with no pity. The road curve of versatile is a represent. Watching the murder. Watching the Jamaica, like every other country, had found a way to produce cakes from wheat flour. Some were incredible in texture and taste, while others were not so great. Some of the earlier editions of cakes were the triangle cake with jam in the middle, after which they transitioned into buns and gingerbread or bullas. These are more dense and heavy style cakes, hence the reason the bulla is called the bulla cake. The bulla cake introduction to Jamaica can be traced back to the 19th century, where it was known as the Cartman's Hymn Book. A flat, round cake, about 10 cm in diameter, made from cheap, soft wheat flour, or what is called counter flour, wet sugar, which is heavily saturated with molasses for sweetness and taste. Then they add soda, water, and flavored with ginger. This bulla sometimes had a hole in the center. It was also known as one of the cheapest cake on the market. It became attractive to the poor class. The bulla was made into a smaller version and served in high-end hotels with the French name. In 1960, bulla or bulla cake started to see a change with the addition of baking powder, butter, salt, spices, orange peel and vanilla and was paired with buttermilk or avocado. Now we can find bulla in mainly the country areas with a more square shape. After the bulla came the coconut toto, which is another cake. Then you had the rock cookie. Then you had jackass corn, which we will discuss more of in the maize or corn category in a further episode. Emerging in the shadows was the spice bun, a rectangular loaf, moist and heavy with an array of fruits. Its composition is similar to a hot cross bun, merged with a fruit cake or a black cake. The spice bun had two versions, the plain bun that was consumed daily 
that also came into a small round dome or a loaf. Then you have the large loaf that is saturated with dry candied fruits that is called Easter bun. There is no way we could discuss the flower product and not talk about cocoa bread and its counterpart, Jamaican patty. The flaky dough filled with seasoned force meat is probably one of the most popular wheat byproduct globally. Patty was introduced to Jamaica around the late 17th to early 18th century. They were made in round pie-like pans, stuffed with force meat, after which it adapted an English influence where it shaped change to a half a circle or resembled an empanada. For the next 300 years, the patty has seen some change in shape, taste and filling and it is one of the most dominant products on the market. It was easy to manipulate the texture by adding fat to the flour and the fat that was typically used back then was called suet which is the beef fat that is present around the liver or the kidney. This fat was able to hold a higher temperature and created a more flakier dough. Presently, we're seeing the bakeries using shortening, margarine, and some are even using pork lard to create that texture. Texture, texture. Yo, why you are on the cut in a murder, the lard today. Whoa, we're cooking up a storm today. Buat kutip podcast Pastry Bear. Aku suka mendengarkan podcast Pastry Bear. Jangan lupa like, comment, subscribe. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Pastry Bear podcast. Please join us next week as we continue to discuss more of the seeds that are responsible for the creation of the Jamaican cuisine. Please follow us at Pastry Bear TV on Instagram and follow us on Pastry Bear TV on YouTube. Follow, like, share, tell somebody about this program. My mission is to help to elevate the Jamaican cuisine and make it more popular. And I'm doing it by education and entertainment. Listen, guys, we need the support. We need the continual support to help to elevate this cuisine because it is necessary for the future of the younger generation. And it is my responsibility to do whatever it takes to bring forth this message. Because I remember there was a time in my life when I wish I could find information like this. My purpose is to create a system around the Jamaican food to make it more palatable, more appetizing, and more enticing to the young people. So the more young people want to get into cooking, and the ones that are already in cooking want to dig deeper into their local ingredients. I realize that a lot of young chefs are there and they want to learn about food. They want to learn about the cuisine, but there's no system set around the cuisine. And I want to help to create a system around it. So if there's anyone out there listening to this podcast and you feel like you can assist us in this venture, please send me an email at pastrybeerco at gmail.com. Again, pastry, P-A-S-T-R-Y-B-E-A-R-C-O at gmail.com. Or you can email me at T-H-E-R-H-H-G-R-O-U-P at gmail.com. Thank you. 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 Thank you